I'm going to uh, kick off the panel discussion by introducing Stephen Davis, our uh, moderator for today. He's the CEO at IWN Inc. He's building Intelligent Wireless Networks Inc., which is a brand um, while developing a new market vertical in agriculture connectivity. He has developed all of the products and marketing for the company while running all of the pilot projects to date including the largest Wi-Fi network ever attempted at EDC Las Vegas in 2014, where he connected 20,000 clients per minute. And I'll let Stephen talk to you a little bit more about himself and what he does, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. So yes, my name is Steve Davis, uh, CEO and co-founder of Intelligent Wireless Networks. We go by IWN these days. Um, we, what we do is much easier to explain what we are not than it is to show you what we are. So can I ask everybody to do one thing really quickly? Nothing's going to happen. Don't be afraid. Close your eyes for just a few minutes, please. Now in this darkness, you can see nothing but darkness, yet you know everybody's in this room. You know there's chairs, you know there is a floor, there's lights, water bottles, tables, there are people here. Yet somehow right now there is a space between all of that that you've just put that is darkness. Open your eyes. That space between is what IWN is. We are everywhere, we are nowhere. <laughs> We are everything, we are nothing. What do I mean by that? If I want to connect this water bottle to that water bottle down there, I have a few options, actually I have quite a few options. But if I want to do it without moving, there is space between these two things that I have to figure out how to use to make that connection happen. That's what happens when you connect a cell phone to a cell tower. That's what happens when you connect a computer to the internet. The space between is actually what we live in, breathe, experience life in, but we also don't ever give it any attention. We don't ever really think about that space between. We think about the things we see, the people, the places, the sensors, the devices, all of those things that create a result that we see, and then we can then take that result with us and try to dissect it. Yet the source of all those things is really the space between. That space where you can't really describe it, but you know it's there. That space that in silence seems as vast as anything you can even imagine. Yet it's right there in front of your face. Without that space between and that knowledge and understanding of that space between, we can't talk to Mars. We can't talk to each other. We can't even have a conversation because the words that are coming out of my mouth right now are reaching you through the space between. Understanding that space between is what ag tech, agriculture, technology, the combination of the two is really all about. So I want you to take all that incredible information that you got today, all the numbers and statistics and all those types of things, and I want you to set that over to the side in, in part of your brain because you're going to draw, draw from that at time to time. As you listen to the rest of these folks, as you take this information out into the world with you, you're going to dip into that knowledge. You're going to dip into this knowledge. And you're going to start to make connections in that space between, where everything starts to make sense, where everything starts to become a reality of how it got there. So I want to submit to this panel the first question of, are we asking the right question in ag tech? I'd like to start with the gentleman at the end and let's have, let's, let's actually, I'd like you to introduce yourself so that we know who you are and what's happening. Have to be formal. My name's Kirk Chidock. I'm actually locally been here in the feed business, our family for 53 years. So formerly Ridge Feed and Supply. My Sun, third generation, realized it's time for change, so we changed our name to Simply Country. But we still own the business, family business. Um, this that I have in front of you 
is sprouted grain. This is my ag tech project, if you will. Been involved in this for about nine years. And, uh, you know, I can't answer your question yet because I just got here. <laughs> so I'm going to get a flavor for what's happened, and then I'll have to come back and answer that question for you. Thank you. Mine's a little more tangible than the space in between. This is real. You can touch it. That's all I can say. I hope we don't have to stand. <laughs> uh, so my name's Eric Blue. Um, I guess I'm a mixture of foodie, farmer, and technology. Uh, so I live on our family farm, Blue Oaks Ranch. Uh, we have small dairy and specialize in breeding stock. Um, I, come, I come from a background in uh, working with um, uh, MarTech, marketing technology, work on a project with Comcast, Comcast Business to build out a lead generation system for their business side. And then I'm also on the board of Nevada County Grown, which is our local marketing association for farms. Um, what's the question? <laughs> Are we asking the right question? Um, yeah, I thought a little bit about that. You know, our county is so, so much made up of small farms. So I was looking at the area of what was presented today that what applies to us. Um, w one issue, issue we have in this county, and I've seen it from my experience on Nevada County Grown and with the marketing, is we're very slow to adopt new technology. Um, you know, in the marketing and communication space, very few of our farmers use marketing technology, email marketing, even social media. Um, so <clears throat> adopting some of this new, particularly internet-based or cloud-based technology, I think is going to be difficult, even if we have broadband. I think one of the issues driving that is the average age of a farmer in this county is 58, and they're not quick to adapt technology, particularly cloud-based or cell phone-based. Um, I experienced that in my own farm. My mom, absolutely, she's a Luddite, so adopting new technology is very difficult uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, where I see where it's really going to be helpful is, uh, we've seen this with Nevada County Grown, where it's a, a demand and getting to market kind of issues. Um, aggregating, I love the, um, the decentralized model that you put up there, decentraling farming here and using um, technology to connect the farms in our community and get product to market and build relationships, I see as being a huge um, benefit. And then <clears throat> the big initiative for Nevada County Grown for this year is agritourism. I'm glad Robert mentioned that $7 trillion global uh, tourism uh, GDP. Um, well, we see that as a huge benefit in this county. We already have are a big draw for uh, tourists, particularly with the outdoors, with our, our uh, culture, with our health and wellness, you know, with our performing arts. So we're bringing people here and then making them aware of what's going on in our farming community because the eyeballs are already coming to this county, I think is really important. On our own farm, we use Airbnb and we are very successful attracting, particularly San Francisco tech types that are fascinated coming here to experience a transparent look at a organic farm. Um, what I think is great about the agri or the um, agritourism model is, you know, we've already seen success in other tech startups like Airbnb, like what we've seen in marketing and Facebook, and those are really e easy, low-cost point of entry for people to start getting used to cloud-based technology. And I think by helping our membership on Nevada County Grown and our farmers in our community through agritourism, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Before we go on, I, I'm going to stop right there because that was a fantastic answer to that question and there were so many actual answers in that uh, description. The first question that I asked when we got into this is, who am I dealing with? I come from a farming family. My family farmed in Utah my entire life, Utah and Wyoming, vast amounts of land with Still, that technology that Robert showed us up there was still being used when I was a kid. We used a team with a steel plow. That actually happened in my lifetime. Now they're ornaments around yard art. <laughs> really cool to see the, the evolution of that technology. And I got out of farming and became an inter, uh, RF guy. I'm an RF engineer. And you can, you've heard some of the things that I've, I've done. Um, but in getting into ag tech or agriculture period, the question isn't about all the fluff, isn't it? It's not about all the data. It's about those two individuals right down there. Do we really understand what they do before we go build them something? Do we really know 
how that grass down there is grown. Have we been out there? Have we touched it, felt it, smelt it, seen it, seen what happens as it effortlessly comes out of the soil with the prescription that, that they put on the land to be able to grow that through that space between. So the space between can be so many different things. It can be Silicon Valley building things that these gentlemen don't even understand yet. Why? Because what's going on in Silicon Valley is not what's going on on their farm, right? What's going on in Silicon Valley is technology. What's going on over here is breeding life. How do we mix those two? That's the big key. How do we do that? If you've, if you've followed agriculture, if you know what agriculture, if you've ever done the etymology in ag, agriculture comes from preparing the soil, from growing, from growth. That's the etymology of the word. Technology is about weaving. So we need to weave this in there, and we need to think about that. How do we weave what Silicon Valley and these technologies are building into their lives so that it's not a wall of technology coming at them that is very scary? And we see this with our growers every day. We see this with our growers getting frustrated and upset when someone sells them something, and they realize, I've only got 1.3 megabits coming into my shed. Well, what do I do now? I just spent $25,000 on your product. And yes, I'm sure it works because you showed me it works. But what do I do now? My daily reality is I can't even YouTube. So do we, are we asking the right questions? Um, next, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Susie Sedfin. I am uh, the director founder of the Tahoe Food Hub. And we are supporting sustainable agriculture by creating a regional marketplace for local and small farms to access new markets and get a fair price. Uh, our distribution is Tahoe, so North Lake Tahoe at this point, with plans to expand into uh, the Reno portion of you know northern Nevada, so it encompasses Lake Tahoe, Reno, as it's re often referred, as well as South Lake Tahoe. Uh, but right now, it's just Tahoe City up to Incline Village, Truckee, and our farmers are Grass Valley, Nevada City, down to Auburn, Penner, and Newcastle, Lincoln, in that area, and touching into Sacramento. Um, as far as the question, um, I guess it started with my question. I used to manage and develop the, uh, develop the national tour for the Wild and Scenic Environmental Film Festival, and I did that for five years. And in 2009, if you remember all the food films that came out, um, and our job was to screen all of those. And I think we probably took 10 to the festival, but there was probably 35 or 40 that got submitted. And so it was just kind of like, you know, just kind of getting punched a few times. And I just was a sponge for it. I mean, I just, I still have like the book and notebooks I kept from all of that. And it just itched at me for a couple years. And two years later, I decided to quit my job and took an independent study for a year to ask that question, what can we do to fix our food system? And it really just kept coming back around to, you know, how can we help farmers get their food to market? Um, on the consumer side, I think the question that often gets asked is, more farmers markets. <laughs> and, you know, that was great 10, 15 years ago. It got people thinking about food, where it came from, wanting to know their farmer. But if we want to change our food system, we have to get it into the places people are eating and buying food. And, and that's not a farmer's market. We need to make it um, convenient, but that convenience doesn't mean cheap. It just means getting it into, the, like, restaurants, our schools, our hospitals, and without compromising price for the small farm at the same time. Um, uh, and as we've, as we've developed, we're five years old now, um, which is like, I still can't believe that was like five years. Um, you know, it started really small. And um, I think that's another, you know, question people think you have to start with like this, okay, like plan and spend and infrastructure. And, you know, I just literally picked a point. I, I bought a van and, you know, slowly kind of circled my way out from there. And now I was just down here this morning looking at it planning for a 4,000 square foot space and we have three trucks. But, you know, if you try and start with that, you're going to fail miserably. And I think a lot of startup businesses do that. You try and start with too much too fast and you just got to start small and build a groundswell. And that's what we've done in Tahoe. As far as a tech perspective, what's really changed it for us is um, an online, it's you know, initially it was like spreadsheets, like getting chefs to buy stuff just by sending a spreadsheet back to us. But then there are websites out there, software pl platforms. Ours is called Local Orbit, um, and it's intended for farmers to upload their products. But to really understand what we're selling, we upload all that product online each week to a website. Uh, it's like, you know, like an Amazon. It's like shopping cart, you know, based program. And 
it's interesting because the question, like people, you said, like tech people want to help, <laughs> and so it's tech people who started Local Orbit, but. I'm like, did you ever aggregate food? Did you ever grow food? Like, who are you asking when you're building this software? Because I mean, it was just, I was on the ground, like one of their first customers, and I was just like, and like, who, who, when you're developing, oh, we just updated. I'm like, when did you, who did you decide to update with? Like, you gotta like talk to people who are actually on the ground using your product so you can know how to update it properly. Fortunately, uh, a farmer and a food hub manager has just bought Local Orbit, and I can already tell the difference. So I'm like, okay, phew, I think we're on a good track now. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Macon, and uh, like most bald guys, I wear several different hats. Um, <laughs> I am... Uh, <laughs> I, my, my day and sometimes night job is as the Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor for UC Cooperative Extension um, for Placer, Nevada, Sutter, and Yuba counties. Um, my other day and, and all-night job is as um, co-owner and manager of a small-scale commercial sheep operation here in the foothills. We've run sheep here for about 15 years. Um, and with that hat, I'm also the incoming president of the California Wool Growers Association, which I like to remind my cattlemen friends is the oldest livestock organization in California. <laughs> Not that there's any range wars anymore. Um, I think one of the, the kind of the context for that question for me in working with, with rangeland livestock production is that rangeland ag is very, very different than cultivated ag. Um, different in terms of the landscape and, and the extensiveness of the operations. You know, in, in Nevada County, on annual rangeland, you've got to have 20 acres to run a cow. So if you're a commercial operation, you're dealing with large landscapes. And the other piece of that is that they're very remote. Um, not only is there not broadband access, in many cases there isn't cell phone access, um, which I find reassuring in some cases, but <laughs> technology um, that's driven by um, by broadband or by cell um, coverage doesn't necessarily work in those those parts of our counties. Um, and then I think the other piece related to that is that margins are very thin, and there is an economic component to technology for producers that I think is really important to remember. Finally, I think the third element to the to the difference for me is that it's um, it's complicated because you've got plants, animals, and people in this system. And honestly, people are probably the least able to communicate effectively with the other two. Um, but it does make for a complicated system. One of the things that we really focus on in our programs within Extension is, is um, the economics of small-scale farming and ranching. And I think, um, I know I am guilty of this too, the, the latest and greatest technology looks really cool take a minute, sit down, and figure out what the return on that investment is. Um, if it's not saving labor or increasing your pr productivity, you know, it's probably not a wise investment for a business to make. And I think that's important for farmers and ranchers to, to understand very clearly. Um, Gabe mentioned, and I, I would reiterate, that, uh, you know, farm advisors are folks on the ground that can be a bridge between producers and innovators and can be a real opportunity for testing new technology or new, new um, techniques. I also think, and I, I really like the picture of the plow because I've actually plowed with horses myself, um, but I think all technology, we have to think about unintended consequences. Um, what happened when the steel plow met the Great Plains where the rainfall was less than 10 inches a year? We got a dust bowl, and so understanding that there may be some unintended consequences of the technology that we're, we're working on now is, is important. I think we have to ask, we ask, can we do something um, very well? We don't often ask, should we do something? And I think those are two really important questions. The last thing I would hold out just as an example, um, as a small scale rancher, um, somebody talked about software for, for managing livestock. There's nothing that makes sense for my 100 sheep operation to go out and buy commercially. So I think a lot of us hack the technology that currently exists and make it work. Um, we have a secret Facebook group that we record all of our management data. It's essentially my daily journal 
for managing the sheep operation. But it's searchable, and it allows us to upload files and photographs. It allows us to keep a permanent record of our management. And so there are examples like that, I think, that a lot of small-scale ranchers are, are using the technology that's developed for other things to make work. And I think part of that is driven by the economics. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you, Dan. Now, he brings up an interesting, very critical scientific understanding that we've known for so many years. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So let me give you a real world case that we deal with. We have growers, if you haven't figured out, we're an internet company. We've been providing internet to growers now for several years. And it's not just a blanket solution. We provide internet in various different areas. This year we're actually going to light up the entire Salinas Valley. And one of the technologies that's coming out of this is potential free power. Did I just say that out loud? Yeah. I worked on that. <laughs> yes, those are the types of technologies that I'm designing. Those are the types of technologies that exist. And thanks to companies like, I'm going to give a quick plug here for our investor, Greenleaf Investment Fund. It's about to go public on the uh, Canada Exchange. We've been able to pull them in to get some investment, and we are doing exactly what you all are talking about, what Robert and I have been battling back, batting back and forth for years now since the 2012 original uh, state summit. How do we get the tools to the growers that need them so we can get food? And how do we make sure that that action doesn't cause this equal and opposite reaction that causes chaos on the farm? Grower decides to buy a technology doesn't really have the, the understanding of the technology. Most of the time they can't Facebook, they can't YouTube, they can't Pandora. Those things just don't happen out there. Might happen at their house, might, if they're the home alone. Kids can't do homework. So knowing that, and then they adopt a the technology for $25,000 or whatever it is, and the office girl has to figure that out. That reaction sends a cataclysmic reaction inside the grower's facility, and now they don't know what to do with it. How do we adopt? Who, who knows this stuff? Who knows how to do this? So they call up the engineer. Well, he's off engineering on 18, 20 more other farms. He's busy because the need is there. So that equal and opposite reaction has a really serious impact at the ground level in lives in people, in days, in money spent on uh, the, the, the wages. We need to think about that. How do we integrate into a farm? With that question, I believe bring that to you, Chris, how do we integrate into a farm from your, your perspective? So um, I'd actually like to maybe riff on your original one, and then I'll Please. get to that, right? Please. which is the space between, right? Because we've heard some, uh, some great stories here uh, today, and I'm sure there's plenty more out in the audience. Uh, but it made me actually think about the space between, because I'm probably more tech ag than I am uh, ag tech. Um, and so I'll take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, uh, much like you, my family's uh, been in farming since the 1890s, although we were very big in the uh, orange industry in Southern California, which as many of you know, um, suffered from something called quick decline and, and it was really, um, you know, it wiped out. Um, and so, you know, a lot of us had to change uh, myself. Uh, I became enamored with uh, technology now 40 years ago, if I can say that. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen that change a lot um, in my current, uh, tech side of my brain. Um, I run uh, strategic alliances for a, a uh, visual analytics company called Zoom Data. So we do a lot of things with, with streaming and infinite sets of data and that sort of thing. Which is quite interesting, quite quite uh, possibly applicable to a lot of the IoT and, and uh, initiatives that may be applicable, you know, in, in the right um, uh, situation with, uh, with farming. <clears throat> but um, my journey actually then uh, was in the uh, Bay Area, and I decided to relocate here after my children uh, graduated from high school. So I'm very much part of that wave of, um, you know, techies, um, you know, coming back in here. Although I probably don't count myself as a techie, as I've never been to Burning Man, I never will be. <laughs> <coughs> Do you have to be a techie to go to Burning Man? Uh, yeah, well, it, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Um, 
But, uh, you know, we uh, relocated here because in a large way we wanted to get back into, into nature. And, and frankly, I'm the kind of guy that needs a little elbow room. Uh, so we bought, uh, you know, a nice little place uh, way the hell down, McCourtney, um, still in Grass Valley. Um, and uh, I began to be interested in the production of wine. So I went through the certification course at UC Davis. Fantastic course, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and through that, there is a point to the story to get to ag. I became really concerned with the amount of waste that happens in the production of wine and some of the wine derivatives. And it just bothered me um, that um, a, a farmer, a grower, um, invests so much time and energy and good stuff into this. And, and by and large, there's a huge percentage uh, of that crop, of that residual stuff that actually is uh, considered waste. In some cases, uh, hazardous waste because of the um, prevalence of uh, pesticides and maybe pests on it and so forth. Uh, so um, not knowing much about uh, you know agriculture or uh, chemistry, I uh, began to experiment myself and uh, we've produced something which we're beginning to market uh, through my particular startup called Grass Valley Growing Company, which we believe is possibly the finest fertilizer um, uh, out there in the market. And we've had some field trials. It's very early. We've had about 20 uh, different field trials. But through this, what we've been able to do is to repurpose a, a, a waste stream uh, that mankind for thousands of years has been throwing away. And we've been able to prove that this has a particular effectiveness on root growth. And why is that important? Well, roots are really the source, right, of nutrients, of water, of uptake, and so forth. And the current way of uh, maybe putting in highly toxic, topical uh, fertilizers and hoping that some portion of that actually gets down to the roots, you know, causes a lot of problems, as we're all aware of, uh, particularly in some of the newer um, agricultural markets that are um, coming around the state here. Um, and so what we did was to actually prove that what we have uh, can actually um, increase the uh, root growth. Uh, it's very uh, low nitrogen, 0.5, if you can believe that. Uh, so the NPK and all that, you know, I've got the studies and all that, is actually quite low. Why is that? Because what we do is we actually place that into, uh, into the soil, you know, fertigation or topical. And, and th through its nature, through its affinity with its, its source product, that being a, a quite interesting agricultural product itself, <clears throat> we have proven uh, that this greatly enhances root growth. And not only that, we've also proven how to actually push certain flavors through to buds and fruits. Uh, so we can push some interesting things like chocolate, like cherry, like peppermint, uh, like cinnamon, and so forth. This is quite interesting uh, to us and actually to some of the growers, particularly in the cannabis market, obviously, uh, but also in some more fruit. Uh, some of the, you know, there's an interesting way that we push some certain flavors through to strawberries and to, um, and to tomatoes. But we also have found that this is also applicable to other grasses, right? Um, in particular, turf grass. There's a huge problem with golf courses, over fertilization and runoff and so forth. And we have proven this to actually um, increase greatly the, the root growth and robustness of uh, uh, of those grasses, even in uh, stressful areas like in Southern California, semi-arid. So anyway, that's my sort of space between uh, going from uh, historically family being agriculture into technology, kind of coming back out of it. And there's uses for technology, and you know, in in what we're doing now, but sort of rewinding that back into something that, <clears throat> you know, frankly, um, looking at you know where where I'm going as a as a person is actually far more fascinating to me now than uh, uh, than where I'd probably previously been. So anyway, hopefully. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Something. So, Thank you. are you guys? Is everybody catching? It doesn't matter if it was Robert and the rest of the group before or these folks. There's a common theme in here. The common theme is also very chaotic because there's several different disciplines. There's different thought processes. There's different regions. There's different areas. There's different things that we need to, to explore. But yet, here all the way down at this end of the table, grass comes back in where we can talk about it at the other end of the table. This collaboration of getting people together, much like what we're talking about all over the place, is where real innovation comes from. It's taking something that is an idea 
which is the first part of invention. You have to have an idea. What could this be like? What could that, and I'm sorry, is that rice or grass? You said it earlier, but barley. barley. What, what could that be? He had to think about that. What could this be? And look what he did. Look what he did. Outstanding. So with that and that common theme, Molly, you have two questions on the table, please. Hi, everyone. My name's Molly Nakahara, and I am a farmer. I have a farm called Dinner Bell Farm. We're out in Chicago Park uh, here in Nevada County, Grass Valley also, other end. Um, I raise uh, pigs and flowers, quite the combination, a little, little bit of something for everyone. Um, and just really quickly, I'd like to pull the room. So raise your hand if you're a farmer. Are you in production right now? Cool. And raise your hand if you are a tech person, developing tech. Raise your hand if you're another. And raise your hand if you ate today. <laughs> so um, I think the great sort of power that I've seen in my own farming and, oh, I also should say that I work with Sierra Harvest. I'm also the director of the Farm Institute, which is the branch of Sierra Harvest that is working to support our local food system um, by providing direct support to our farmers and ranchers. So access to information and access to land um, and access to training. Um, so that's the, I like to wear hats as well. That's the other hat. Um, you'll lose your hair. That I do. Um, so just kind of back to that moment of us all raising our hands, you know, this agriculture and food is this thing that sort of brings us all together around the dinner table. You know, it's the thing that unites us all and, and gives us this common place. For the most part, we all eat. And um, the thing that I have seen technology do, and I've been farming since 2010, and um, connecting people has been this great thing that technology has done for farmers, connecting farmers to each other, um, connecting farmers to their eaters and their customers, and connecting farmers to um, to the products that they the, the things they're working with with the animals and the plants that they work with, um, and and that goes to that sort of space between. It's this information um, exchange that occurs, and you know, f agriculture is this thing that created civilization. It's this amazingly old history. I, we've it's just what we've been doing since we've been become people who've stayed in one place, and that. It's a culture. That's what I love about that word, agriculture. It's that it's this it's this collection of knowledge and practice and history that gets passed down through generations. I'm also um, I'm a third generation farmer. That it was skipped a generation. My grandparents farmed in Salinas um, before World War II, but then lost their farm when they were incarcerated in Japanese internment camps. Um, so. Agriculture is this, you know, huge collection of information, and, and how is it that we learned um, to do what we do? It's passed down by the generations before who've improved, slowly improved technology, slowly improved practices, um, sometimes making huge mistakes like the Dust Bowl, um, and sometimes having great innovations, um, and slowly but surely we are on the path to producing more and better and beautiful food to feed our community and ourselves. Um, you know, a lot of the farmers and sort of that I see as my peers um, are very excited about appropriate technology and they're very excited about collective knowledge. There's been a big response to um, some the sort of corporate takeover of that collective knowledge and the patenting of seeds and the patenting of these things that we see as shared history and and. Um, and concepts that we all own together and that we all should have access to. Um, and, and because of that, I think there is this great spirit of sharing um, practices amongst farmers now. And so, you know, if you want to connect to some farmers, get on YouTube. You can, I cannot tell you, we've all like learned things from YouTube. It's like, how do you artificially inseminate a sow? Get on YouTube. You know, how do you, how do you um, 
just everything you can think has been shown by a farmer on YouTube. It gets a little gory out there. But that is this great example of what Dan was saying of how farmers are taking a tech, an application that is so creative in, in its potential use and really putting it to use in a way that benefits them in their information exchanging. Um, and, and so that's one thing that I'd like to say is like farmers ultimately are, cr they're creative people. They're taking raw elements. They're in the business of turning sunshine and soil and air and water into food. I mean, it's a very, very creative process. Um, and so we like to have things that we can feel a sense of ownership over and that we can tweak to our own use. Um, and we don't want to have to pay a lot of money for them. <laughs> so, for example, you know, like, go to any farm and ask them what they're using a five-gallon bucket for, and you'll have, like, this crazy list of millions of things that they're doing with five-gallon buckets, stuff that they're just, like, getting at the donut shop down the road. So, you know, there's this, this taking things and turning them into something that fits a very particular system because we're all doing things slightly different on our farms. There's not one model. And I think that's maybe how Nevada County farmers can be a little bit different than the larger scale agriculture. It's, it's very specific to microclimate. It's very specific to the breed of animal that you have or the variety of plant that you're growing or who your market is, you know, are you growing for a food hub? Are you growing for a farmer's market? Everything is a little bit different. Um, and so that ability to be creative with the tools that we have and use them slightly differently is really important. Um, and then the other thing that I'd say is connecting to our customers. And so these social media platforms that really just enable us to tell our story ha have been huge for building customers in this very... Um, you know, it's this real way. It's like, this is what I'm actually doing right now. This isn't a big marketing thing to pull you in. This is like me out feeding my pigs today, or this is me out making a bouquet that's going to the farmer's market tomorrow. And the ability to instantly share that, those images and those um, concepts and practices with the people who are we're ultimately wanting to have these things go home and be at their dinner tables and in their kitchens like that is super powerful and I think there's a lot more opportunity in that area to connect eaters and customers with what is actually happening on the farm in real time so like you know if, if people could buy meat from my farm but actually then anytime they wanted check in and sort of have an opportunity to see what they're, what they're, what's happening on the farm. Or they get an alert on their farm that says, like, time to feed the pigs. And they, like, press that thing, and a little bit of money goes into my bank account, and I go out and feed the pigs. You know, it's just these, these ways of connecting people to the food. Um, I think that I get pretty excited when I think about those sorts of opportunities. So I could keep talking forever, so I'm going to leave it there. That's outstanding. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. That's a fantastic uh, segue into so many different things. The next question that I want to ask you guys, and I want you to think about this, uh, because I really want to play with that barley down there. Um, and I'm going to start with you. But I'm going to, I'm going to preface this for a second. The question is, why are you doing this? What's the reason? Is it money? Is it to improve things? Is it to make a better life? Is it to help a farmer? Is it to make sure you have better food for your family and your kids? It doesn't matter what the reason is, but I will submit this to you. The culture of farming is deep, as she just mentioned. How many years, uh, generations have you been farming? Locally, excuse me, locally, uh, from my wife back there, seven generations in this area. Seven generations. Thank you, by the way. Thank you so much. You deserve a round of applause, as every farmer does, Well, just like does. our veterans. What I will tell you is that these soldiers of the soil, as I call them in many of my writings, need to be celebrated every bit as much as anything else that gives life. Because without them, there is no life. We'd have to do it ourselves. And right now, if we can't look it up on here, and it can't just be a 10 minute deal to fix it, I'm not interested. Most of society's that way. 
We've taken our brain and put it into this and think it will tell us what to do. These folks are still figuring out what to do on a daily basis without technology. So when you run technology out to them, they're still looking at it as though the American Indians, when they were here, looking at the white man going, what, what, what are you doing? What, what, what's the deal? So the question of why is the second most important question we can ask when we get into ag tech. Why did you come up with that? Well, let me say this. <clears throat> when my two or three year old grandkid asked me why, there's never a good answer for that because. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. But I, I will say about this particular thing, they're, they're actually, just to clarify, there is actually some technology in this. This is grown in a, in a piece of equipment that we manufacture. So this is absolutely 100% climate controlled. Um, it's not grown in soil. It's not grown with any fertilizers of any sort. Um, it lends itself very well to being 100% organic non-GMO, which is ideal for environment. There's no runoff. And, and just as an example, um, since I'm in the feed business, I understand the use of water. So for uh, an acre of alfalfa in the San Joaquin Valley, it takes about 54 acre inches of water, which is about like this, to yield about seven or eight ton. With 54 acre inches of water, um, we can produce 1,700 tons of feed. That is 85% digestible. That actually, like you're milking cows, so cows, it's good if they have more fats, more solids in their milk, fats and proteins, it increase their fats and proteins actually improves the omega-3, omega-6 ratio. In other words, it increases omega-3 in the milk. So um, there's a whole lot of reasons why I do this. Mostly, I just think it looks really cool. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and the best part is, is when, it, when one of our units, you seed the seed, six days later, this is what comes out. This started out as two quarts of barley, which is about two and a half to two and three quarters pounds of seed. So, um, when you put it in as seed and then you go to the other end and you harvest because it just has <clears throat> in, incremental trays in there, every day you open the doors and there's feed to feed. So as an example, like in this room, I was just in Missouri last week, installed a system in a room like this that will produce about 500 ton of feed a year. And it will only use 600 gallons of water a day. So if you do the math on that, that's not that's only about two or three acre feet of water for the entire year. Um, it's setting on a space this size to produce, that would take 100, 120 acres. Would in, it would talk about what Dan talked about, all the other things that happen. It would talk, it, you'd have inputs, you'd have tillage equipment, you'd have chemicals possibly, um, but just the tillage equipment and all the other things that go with that, they're gone. And with, with land being a premium and water being a premium, um, that's what excites me about this. And I just like opening doors every day. When I, when I see it, there it is. It's right in front of you. And the reality is the technology we use to do this really is only enhancing what Mother Nature already provided for us. So we didn't really do anything except provide an environment where Mother Nature can perform to its best every day. Doesn't matter if you're in Wisconsin and it's 30 below. Actually, I have a box in Ontario. It's 35 below, and unfortunately, because it's moist inside, one day the doors froze shut, and it couldn't open the door. That was kind of a problem we had to address. <laughs> um, but in Arizona, where it's 122 degrees, it makes no difference. This will produce this consistently year-round, which is a benefit to any producer that's involved in any kind of animal husbandry. Or I go th I've got a gentleman in Southern California that uh, raises worms with it. So it fits all classes of any type of livestock, but does it well. So that my question is why I do it. Um, I'm probably a little bit insane <laughs> because it's one of these crazy things that causes me to travel all over the place to talk to people about it, um, getting huge discussions with nutritionists who are so traditional that they don't really think about what they actually really know, how it works in the animal system. Because they actually know that, but they just look at this and think, well, it can't do that, so I, I don't believe it'll do that. But yet I have literally hundreds of people around the world that use it, that use our equipment, and it works fine for them. So why I do it is because I think it's a good thing. I think for my children, and especially for my grandchildren and other generations, as time goes on, 
as water becomes premium and as land becomes premium, we're going to have to be more efficient in how we do things. So, so mine is, like I said at the beginning, it's not a space out there. It's kind of here, but it's similar because it's hard to really fully comprehend what it can do, even though sprouting grains to feed livestock has been done for centuries. And if you think about it, the bread you eat today is produced from grain that isn't produced the same way, merely in the fact that they don't shock it, let it set in the field, and it partially sprouts before it was ground into flour. That was the advent of the combine. It goes back to what Dan said. There's, there's things that are great, and they do wonderful things, but that changed the nutritional ability of that grain to feed people correctly because it's no longer sprouted. And so that's why I do it, because it's too good not to do. That is outstanding. So are you picking up? Look past the grass. Look past the farmer that you see, that you, you just, we, we label things. People label things. We want to label as fast as we can because we want to know. But what that gentleman sitting right down there is, is not just a farmer. That's a scientist. That's a botanist. He understands the earth. He understands so much more because it's in his DNA from seven generations. So how in the world is a scientist in Silicon Valley that doesn't do what he does trying to figure out and, and building things that he understands, that he can use. There is a disconnect there. So what happens? These folks and the rest of them like that, that do this for a living, come up with things on their own. So what does that tell you? That tells you that inside of each and every one of us, there's a scientist that can really understand. If he just put that into a place where Mother Nature can do her thing, then every single one of us can understand that and do the same thing right uh dan please why do you do what you do i'm sh i'm jumping I'm jumping sorry. around i am jumping because I'm <laughs> it is a pop quiz darn be ready <laughs> um i think that a couple of reasons i think um to get a little bit philosophical i have always rooted for the underdog and if you think about agricultural land Rangelands are the underdog of, of agricultural land. Um, they are our least productive lands in terms of what they can grow. Um, my little sheep herder definition of rangeland is that it's too hot, too cold, too steep, too dry, too something to grow a cultivated crop. But with the miracle of a ruminant animal, those lands can be converted into fiber and food products. And Part of my underdog ethos is also that I, I have always liked being around sheep herders. They're, they are the stockmen that are, are the least respected in many ways. Um, and so both in terms of my professional career and, and what we do with our own sheep, um, I think we look at ways to, um, to make that system both efficient but profitable. Um, it's important to me that, that we operate our business like a business. And so if there are technology tools that make me more efficient and make me more profitable, those are things that we'd look at um, in our own operation. I think the other, other thing that um, I have realized as a relatively new farm advisor is that what I can bring to my community is a, an ability to listen to what the ranchers that I serve need in terms of science or um, economic information. Um, and I think being conscious about asking people what they need, what would make their operations work better, is a really important tool, certainly in, in ac academia. And I think that's really important in technology, too. Um, and not, not to say that there aren't other ways to do this, but I really think Cooperative Extension has those relationships with producers that can provide that bridge. And that's one of the reasons that I, I went into Cooperative Extension as well. Outstanding. Thank you, Dan. Molly, please, why are you a farmer? I've had to tell my parents that answer so many times. <laughs> you too? <laughs> I did study agriculture at university, though. No, so. no wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's, a, that's an interesting question or, or statement. You have to explain to your family why you're growing food. No, no, just why I'm earning the income of a farmer. 
So. Yeah. Is there a difference? <laughs> really? I mean, seriously, think about it. Is there a difference? That what the problem is, or what the, the, the thought process is here, is if you're a farmer, you're not going to make Silicon Valley wages. That's what we look at. That's what we measure by. But she feeds people. Yeah, I, you know, I really sometimes struggle with sort of like, what is it exactly that is being made there? You know, what is it? What is it? <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to pick on Silicon Valley. So uh, yeah, no, I mean, we love Silicon Valley. We do too. They, they are a great marketplace. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, the price of food hasn't changed in 10 years or something. You know, it's like we, whereas everything else has become more expensive. And so uh, particularly for small producers, uh, it's it's tough. There's there's a lot more motivation than making money. I like to say a wise farmer, I heard this from them, so I can't take credit, but we're in it to make a living, we're not in it to make a killing. You know, we there's a we love stewarding the earth. We love working outside, we love working with our hands, um, we love contributing to this great legacy of agriculture and being a part of our communities and uh, being an intimate part of other people's lives. You know, we grow, I grow flowers also, and flowers are this beautiful expression of emotion, and it's so special to know that, like, you know, what my daily life goes to someone sort of helping show someone else that they love them or that they're sorry or that, they, that they'll be part of someone's funeral or someone's wedding or a birth. And um, we... Why, why do I do it? But, I mean, I like... The type of work that it is, I like. I like feeling that I'm contributing to uh, future generations prospering on planet Earth. Um, I'm not interested. I mean, I can't even be under fluorescent lights for that long without getting a headache. So there's just part of, you know, there's a reason. There's like a physical reason that I like doing it. Um, and it is not easy, and it is not always fun, and it is very lonely sometimes, sure. <laughs> and it can be very, um, it can be very hard to be out there in the pouring rain, in the freezing cold, in the boiling hot, um, and not, you know, you're just like you don't necessarily see where, what you're doing, what where it's going to go, and you have to you ask yourself sort of why am I doing this? I could be like sitting inside somewhere right now and checking my Facebook profile and pretending to work or whatever, but just kidding. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there's just a it's part of what we like to do, could, spend could we, our time. Can we boil this down to you love what you do? Sometimes I love what I On do. An <laughs> <laughs> On an average. Yeah, yeah, I would like, I'd say there's a, there's um, an enjoyment in the job, you know, I'm just, I'm not doing it to make money, I'm doing it to be a farmer, I'm doing it to contribute to agriculture. Outstanding, thank you. Uh, Eric, please, why do you do what you do? And really quickly, what do you do? <laughs> just so everybody knows why you're, what, what you're answering the question to. Oh, okay, um, now you threw me off. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, um, well, I was going to follow up with what Steve was saying. So my why is he mentioned fats and proteins. <laughs> so in our dairy, we make about 1,000 pounds of cheese a year uh, with uh, raw goats, sheep, and cow's milk, and having the good inputs go into that. I mentioned that my first part, my why, one of my whys is I'm a foodie. Um, I'm a gourmet chef by hobby, and anybody knows any chefs, the reason they chef is the pleasure that they get when they're serving friends and family the food that they prepared. Um, Steve Hipkin just walked out of the room, but we trade cheese for he makes sauerkraut and pickles. And it's so fun to have a community of people that you can share your artisan handcrafted food products with. Um, the thing that's been really interesting for me, we're a, I'm a... 10th generation farmer. We started in 2002 in Nevada County um, farming. My mom's originally from Switzerland, so she got a goat, you know, and then that goat turned into a herd of a couple hundred, a couple hundred sheep, cows. Um, and I, I kind of came at it from the food side. And what I really learned is the, um, you know, learning a lot about animal husbandry and how the animals are raised and treated and what they're fed. I often say when I'm giving tours at our farm, it's not, you, you aren't what you eat, you are what you eat that they ate. And you know, when you have high quality inputs and very well cared for animals, you get high quality food. And from the chef's side, I've really noticed that how the meat we produce cooks different than conventional, 
tastes different. You know, everything about it is different, and it's all about the quality. I love what Steve said about his grass here, you know, how much different that affects. And you don't see it any more prevalent than we have, we have one Jersey cow. And, you know, in the spring, when that first, you know, fresh grass comes up and, the, you know, the milk is so yellow and, you know, it's 20%, you know, butter fat floating on the top, you know, that's when you can really see, you know, the, you know, the way food was intended to be. Uh, so my why is sharing that with people. I mentioned we have an Airbnb on our farm. Um, when I first moved up here from San Francisco, people asked me, oh, are you going to miss San Francisco? And I go, no, they come every weekend. <laughs> <clears throat> But we get to share something that's truly unique about what we do on our farm. And it truly brings pleasure to see particularly young families that you know, live in San Francisco and don't have access to the type of food and, and quality of life we have up here. And that they bring their children around. We raise rabbits also. And I would say, well, you know, we eat these. And to have the parents say, we want our children to know that an animal you know, isn't a boneless, skinless thing on a styrofoam thing wrapped in cellophane. It actually came from an animal that was well cared for and, you know, the circle of life. And it's just really interesting to see, you know, see the, their reaction to that and how, how at least a small segment of the population is embracing that. So uh, I love farming through food. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Susie, please. Um, well, I think for me... It's, you know, it's, it's actually the opposite of tech. You know, it just comes back to a, a kind of a human, kind of, and a little bit what Molly was talking about is, you know, tech and money can make your life easier, um, but it can't buy you happiness. And um, I, pretty much ever since college, I think I could always just remember, like, oh, it's like there's something I'm going to do. I'm going to contribute. Not, you know, I'm not looking for fame, just looking to, like, just this restless, anxious feeling that I just really, just, I don't know, I wanted to contribute to something and, and make a difference. And, you know, so you're kind of looking around all these different corners, like, oh, this is it. You know, I'm going to, you know, go down that path for a while. I'm like, no, oh, oh. still, I'm still kind of restless and looking for something. And um, I think I'm probably part Labrador because I'm just, you know, I, I don't tire very easily, and so now I am tired. <laughs> very, very tired. Um, but that's good. I mean, and that's and I'm not restless anymore. I'm not anxious because, and I and I kind of go back um, to. The, I feel like that kind of one of those starting points was an article by Timothy LaSalle, who is the executive director of the Rodell Institute. Um, May 5th, I think, 2008. I mean, it's kind of like one of the days I feel like it changed my life and I learned about mycorrhizal fungi. And I was like, and then it goes back to what you were saying. It's like, why not? Like, why are we not farming like this? Like, we can, you know, divert climate change and we can re sequester carbon and, like, have soil, you know, rich, carbon-rich soils that can retain water and, um, and grow healthy food all at the same time. And it's like, and I think that's really what set me just on this path to, like, okay, what do we need to do to um, foster more of that, like sustainable agriculture, make it easier for farms who are growing food, you know, in a good, fair way. And, yeah, so then Food Hub. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you so much. Um, Dan. I'm gone. You I have gone. I'm sorry. Yeah. Chris, you're last. Sure. Yeah, Best so so me. why uh, yeah, you know, why do I do this? Well, as I said, uh, um, you know, coming back full circle uh, you know, through this space between, uh, but also just the, uh, you know, it was it was a problem. And being an engineer, as you probably tell, uh, maybe um, it it just bothered me, right? It just bothered me that there was this this waste uh, of uh, of of energy of of good organics that, you know, could probably be repurposed and and not. Not being constrained with, um, I'll say, formal learning in terms of, uh, you know, botany, organics, and chemistry, although I've taken some of those courses, I think that enabled me to, in some sense, see around the corner um, and, and, you know, experiment with something that nobody would have even thought about. Um, and happily, you know, I think there's a pathway to do something which is, I think, tremendously beneficial, um, you know, to to the planet, to mankind. Um, I can even... Uh, extrapolate that, uh, in fact, many of these things uh, could be extremely useful on different planets uh, if uh, if you if you 
put your mind out there. Uh, but, you know, it was really that and it really kind of ignited a passion um, in coming out of the high-tech world, out of a large city where you can't move around, people staring at you, you know. I just had enough of that, right? So being out, um, you know, out in the open, back to nature, sort of back to your roots in, in some sort of uh, fundamental sense uh, was, uh, you know, was really interesting to me. And, uh, you know, it's fun. It, it's actually kind of fun to uh, to see what you've done and see the effect on you know uh, on a crop on something and well, I'll, I'll try it right and uh, you know sometimes it works and uh, minor amount of time maybe it doesn't work so well but it always seems to be beneficial so I think it's just more having fun and you know trying to do something new outstanding thank you how are we doing on time okay. Holy an hour. All right. Do you guys want to do it? Actually, actually, yeah, we can break. Can you talk to the apps for ag and hackathon that you have um, every, uh, you know, like every summertime? Uh, yeah. Like I'll, I'll, I'll quickly give a, a shout out for that. Sure. Um, we, one of the things that, you know, we're passionate about, <clears throat> I'm very humbled and honored to be uh, here with all of you and I'm taking to heart all of what you're saying. Um, one of the things that uh, we have a passion for is in engaging youth, and um, you know, I, 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 I'm very keen on us thinking about our future generation and um, bringing the tech people to food and bringing the folks who are agriculture aware to technology, so we can create better, more appropriate technology that is food and farmer aware. And so that uh, we start to, to build these interactions from the ground up rather than trying to now uh, create connections when everybody's uh, all grown up and has uh, careers and uh, mindsets that are already set, set. So Apps for Ag was really a way to say, can we create um, excitement around um, just a very simple premise around creating a contest to uh, solve um, key, key problems in agriculture through um, through you know ver a very simple technology format and it's uh, actually Robert well, you were part of the first one weren't you so I, I mean I'm we're, I'm part of the last one so we we just did the the, the latest one but this was uh, done first at West Hills College three day uh, hackathon wherever you kind of get farmers you get uh, pest control advisors you get the community we start we started at West Hills College you bring technologists from other places. You create a specific challenge. What was the first challenge at West Hills, or was there a specific one? Well, I, I, I think um, what we did was we matched a farmer to each team. So the idea was the farmer from in West Hills is in Kalinga, so it's in Fresno County. So the way it worked out was I think there were five farmers who came, and they were five or six, and they were each matched with a team. And the farmer's instruction was describe a problem that you have that you, you are looking for an ag, sort of an app solution possibly for. Don't say what you think the solution should be. Just describe the problem because we don't want to bias the team. And then the team was all students, um, basically all students. They were either from West Hills and there were a couple from uh, UC Santa Barbara. And there's just, so there's about four or five people, and they worked as, as a hackathon does. They started on Friday and they worked through Sunday, and they came up with all you know, totally all come up with a solution. Farmers there for advice, and then they presented it, and then you had the competition just like you think of as a hackathon. And it's a way to draw solutions to the grassroots. It's a way for farmers to have direct input because you've already alluded to that a lot of times. The, the challenge of the tech sector is they're sitting there, they create these things, but they don't necessarily have farmers in mind or understand farming. This is short-circuiting that. The farmer actually tells you, this is my problem. And then the kids who have, who have no binders on it, the goal was because they have no background and bias into anything, they might come up with a solution that you would never expect, and that's what the that's what they did every did. every time. <laughs> yeah. Did they find one that will reduce the smell in 
<laughs> oh, that's weird. <laughs> so, so one of the things we're thinking about and open to any suggestions is, you know, how can we build on this platform of Apps for Ag and hold more of these things in more places that are local to the community and uh, things like uh, let, let's focus on uh, appropriate technology, not just ag tech. Um, let's focus on small farms and, and smaller farmers and, and local issues and uh, social issues related to food as well. So, so um, we're thinking about the, the future of Apps for Ag and like to scale it up to where more communities are doing it. And we'll, we'll kind of run a, a, a statewide competition out of the, the, all these various local efforts. So stay tuned for, for some of that. We'll connect back with the community on your thoughts about how to hold one in this region. Outstanding. Back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, to go with that, just a quick plug for something else that we're doing. With growers, uh, and it actually, I came up with the idea, but growers are the ones that actually started telling me they're interested. Uh, it's called the Growers Tech Exchange. And what that ends up being is, for example, uh, the right technologies. Simple little things like many of our growers want to be able to use things like Google, but nobody understands it. They want to be able to do things like T-sheets or all these applications. Nobody in their group knows how to use it. Where does a grower go to be able to get insight on how to integrate a simple technology like Google into their operation. Google Drive, Google Suites, build, an app, build a website. I can't even explain to you how many growers just aren't at a level society thinks they should be. And they're not. And it's not their fault. We've let all of that space between out there where food and less people are be passed by the 21st century and it still goes on how much Robert how much is our farm gate here what's the number yearly of our, our oh, California yes 50 billion dollars comes out of a 20th century at best techno technological industry why why do these people do this because they love it they, they love it may, they may not love all the mud and the crud and the crap but they love the fact that their product does something for you, for me. That's amazing. That's outstanding. Our growers, a lot of times, people don't really realize this. You want to go down to, to any of these, and I've been to many of them, from London to Silicon Valley, to the uh, incubators. And uh, you go into these incubators, and people are talking about some really cool things. There's some geniuses creating some awesome things. Not one grower. Not one grower in any of these things. And then they go to the business side of it, which everyone up here is a business person too. You don't believe me? We just heard how many people are using that barley down there. He's a businessman on top of everything else. A very talented businessman. And all of his inputs go into a product up front. Anybody want to go down to the bank and take out a million dollar loan? put it into some land and put it into some, some barley and put it into some cows that might make it through the year, that the weather might help you or it might destroy you, hoping at the end of the year that the, the market has actually sustained so you can get a million point one out of that million dollars and start the process over again. That's an amazing thing we ask of our growers every single season, every year. So with all of these te technology and things, the thing, that, the thing that's missing, the thing that I, that I think that I see that doesn't happen is we treat food and the production of food the exact same way we treat buying anything that we want on Amazon. Click. Here it is. Got it. Oh, I got it. That doesn't work in food. Food doesn't materialize for months, and then you got to hope it happens. So that human interaction that we have that's missing, if you want to be able to get into ag tech, go spend time with one of these folks or any of the farmers that are out there. Not just say, hi, what are you doing? Look around. Oh, this is really cool. We were on a farm. My boots are dirty today. 
and they're standing there with rubber boots on. Go spend time with them. If you want to develop someone for something for a guy that herds sheep, do not think you can develop something for someone who's growing barley. Doesn't work that way. Go spend time with them. Understand what they do. Ask them the question I'm going to ask. What do you need? What do you need from us, from technology, from your community, from your state, from your governments? What do you need to help you do what you do? Please, Molly. Great question. Um, one thing that made me think of a plug for Sierra Harvest, uh, Sierra Harvest has this great potluck series that goes through the summertime, um, and they're, they happen every other week from June to September. Am I right, Malika? Um, and they're at different farms across the county. And so you can come a little bit early and go on a tour of the farm led by the farmer. And then it's a potluck meal. So you bring a dish to share and everybody sits down and eats together at the farm. And they're really fun and they're a great way to sort of see the ag landscape and get a sort of intimate look at agriculture here in the county. So definitely look, Sierra Harvest website has information on, on those. Um, what do I need? Uh, you know, uh, I think on a big scale, I would love people to really understand the value of food. And so particularly in small scale and sort of more like sus sustainable carbon farming, where we're really paying attention to the impact that the process of agriculture has on the land and trying to improve the land through agriculture, not just sort of extracting what we can in steady state, but really thinking about are we putting more carbon into the soil? Are we... Um, are we treating our animals with dignity and respect? That takes a lot more um, time and land, and um, it's a different model than just packing in as many as you can in one spot and sort of de shipping off the refuse of that to someone else. And But that doesn't translate that well into the marketplace. And so even though there are new um, st standards and, and marketing options for farmers like certified organic, um, it's really hard to compare these different farming models, which is why I think that like opportunity to exchange real-time information and like visual um, the story of the farm could potentially help. Um, but you know, we we as a society don't spend that much money on on food, and I, I'm not going to ask people to. I don't. I do ask people to sort of shell out cash for it, but. Um, in a way that is like because I want them to participate in what we're doing on the farm. Like the way we're raising pigs is important because the way that 99.99% of the rest of the pork is raised is torturing animals and creating a huge amount of waste. So, you know, for that understanding to sort of also then translate into value maybe um, is, is something. And I, I think there's probably a way for tech to aid in that. Um, what else do we need? Um, think about that, and yeah. let's go to Chris. Let's, let's think about that question for a minute, because that's a question that when I ask my growers, what do you need from me? It really depends on the day. The last grower that we did uh, an electrical service for to a brand new building, that's what he needed. And we started taking it into a completely different direction with him, and he went, wait a minute, I actually need an awning on my house now. <laughs> he completely shift gears on us. Because it's also his livelihood. It's his life. So their office isn't just where they, they are all day. They're at their home, too. And they'd like to be able to go home just like the rest of us would. So it really depends on the day what they need from us. And unless we're in tune with them, unless we're speaking with them, unless we're engaging, we have no idea what they need today or what they even need on a global scale across their operation. So that question to you, Chris, please, what do you need? Sure. Um, so we're in quasi startup mode. Um, so I'm looking for people to come along on the journey. Um, you know, I'd be looking for folks that are uh, either growing, uh, you know, a cannabis, uh, a legal cannabis, uh, ideally, um, <laughs> uh, place, um, or that have, uh, you know, a reasonable, um, uh, set of their their crops, particularly in uh, in strawberries, that uh, might like to experiment a little bit. Uh, but we also have some things which um, there's some extensions to um, the the process that we have uh, that we believe, and it's complete 
conjecture. So I'd be interested in some of the uh, uh, livestock farmers here. Uh, we believe that some of our, um, I guess I'd call it resulting um, uh, uh, <laughs> product in a solid form uh, could uh, mitigate methane gas uh, uh, in uh, in ruminant an animals. So I'd be really interested to, uh, uh, you know, maybe begin some of those, um, you know, experiments. I'm not sure how we're going to measure what comes out or doesn't come out, but um, you know we have to figure, we have to figure that out. But you know there's there's some there's some uh, you know there's there's three or four derivatives that you know we've been thinking about. Um, so we're really looking for folks to you know go on a little bit of a journey, uh, often the unknown, uh, but um, uh, you know that that's that's kind of where where we are right now. So outstanding, thank you, Dan. What do sheep need? So first, I'm going to address your question. Um, Dr. Frank Mintliner at UC Davis has climate controlled feeding pens to test methane production and other air quality parameters. So okay. that might be somebody to talk to right. um, and does a lot of that kind of work. Um, I, so I will wear my sheep herder hat to answer this question. Um, I, think, I think one of the things that I'm very cautious about is thinking that my particular production system would work for anybody else. My system fits my land and my needs and my family, and so I'm very cautious about saying somebody else um, has a system that's inappropriate. That being said, we have gotten to almost entirely out of direct marketing our product um, because it was a way for us to go broke faster, to spend extra money to take a live lamb and put it into a package. Um, we made our money raising the lamb. We didn't make our money putting stuff in, in CrowVac. And so from my perspective, I think some of the work that's been done on developing new products that adds value to the things that I produce, um, Superior Farms, which is the largest um, lamb processor on the West Coast, buys most of our lambs. They just implemented an electronic, first ever approved by USDA electronic grading system in their facility, which if I had the technology on my end, could give me real-time information about the quality of my lambs, the quality and yield of my lambs. Um, I think that's really exciting because then I can figure out which ewes are producing the best lambs and which um, rams are the most productive. And But that's going to take some technology investment on my scale that at the moment probably doesn't make sense economically. Um, at the, the, on, uh, the other thing I think is really exciting being a fiber producer is that we've gone back from the idea that everything synthetic is great and everything natural is bad to understanding that wool has some pretty amazing properties and the wool market reflects that the wool market has actually improved because of that which helps even somebody at my scale um, in terms of at the on-farm level I think some technology that would allow me to use this thing to read an electronic ear tag and then enter data about that particular animal would be outstanding. If we can take credit card payments on these, we ought to be able to read electronic ear tags on these. Yep, yep, yep. Um, the other thing, having grazed lots of pretty rough country with um, interesting toxic plants on it, I would love an app that I can say, this is what my sh the symptoms that my sheep is exhibiting. What did it eat? And go find that plant and get rid of it, um, which seems like something we ought to be able to do. And then the last piece I think would be really helpful at all scales are some, some portable planning tools. Um, you know, in my case in particular, being able to get real-time estimates of actual forage production so that I can plan where my sheep are grazing and how long they can stay there and, and kind of what that system looks like. That's right now is pretty, it can be done, but it's pretty expensive. And I think having some ability to do that, um, again, using this would be really helpful. Chris, I'm gonna go, so okay. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, before you, before you go, okay. um, I just it reminded me, um, it might spur something for you. There's a story that a grower told me about something that Dan was talking about, and you notice that pretty much everybody's multifaceted, right? They've got a couple of different things they're doing at least. So he, he tells me about this story of this farmer and his wife. That are, I'm going to pick on barley because it's right there. 
they're raising barley and the barley market's going crazy and it's going down and they're, they're having a hard time and they're really concerned they're going to have to sell the farm and they go down and a farmer buys his seed and he just happens that the seed got batched wrong and he ends up with a bunch of corn in one of the bags. He gets home and he plants it all anyway, whatever, and the corn takes off. The barley's not doing much. The corn is going crazy. And a couple of years, it's still going crazy, and they planted more and more. And three years go by, and they're so excited. They're, they're ex they've expanded. They've got all this new equipment. Corn's doing fantastic. And the, the farmer's wife looks at him. She says, isn't this wonderful? Isn't this wonderful? Look, we've done it. We've done it. And he says, yeah, at this pace, we can continue to farm barley for another th 10 years. <laughs> we we kind of get into that, right? We love what we do. We do something because that's what we want to do, and we find things that help us to do that. That's really kind of the essence of farming, um, and it kind of has to be. We don't get to go to a job every day and just pull a paycheck. We have to make that paycheck, and so we become in innovative. So please, Susie. Um, well, the nonprofit, um, a large part of what we do is educating the community on why a regional and sustainable food system is important economically uh, for our health and our environment. Um, if I could just, you know, put people into an isolation booth and then they come out the other side, just like I get it, <laughs> I gotta pay money, I gotta pay some money for my food, and farmers are working hard to do that, and we should not be, you know, putting you know, conventional and synthetic pesticides into our soil. That's the cone of conduct. <laughs> <laughs> But it is, I mean, it's like, it's totally two steps forward, one step back so often, um, you know, beating the streets, talking to chefs, you know, and trying to get them on board and you get them and then they stop ordering and you still see on their menu locally sourced when possible. Um, <laughs> um, there should be police actually for that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm being funny. But, I mean, it's true, though. I mean, a lot of restaurants are making money, and it's not fair. I'm sorry. Actually, no. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you right there, because that is... Everyone wants to jump on the farm-to-table bandwagon. Oh, I'm locally sourcing. I'm working with small farms, and they work with like a tomato farmer for like one month of the year, and they put and they put that disclaimer on their menu, and I'm, and that's not helping any of us. That's not helping any of the farmers when that happens. So no, I think that's that would be okay. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, and so it does. It takes you can see you can hear it. It takes a community to build a food system, and maybe it takes individual people policing those. Restaurants like really well, who do you work with um, when you're saying this locally sourced? Uh, it's, a, it's on us. We're the people who need to be asking those important questions of our restaurants and um, and ensuring if that's really important to them that they are being ethical about it. Um, and so in, in taking, you know, it takes a community, it's a tagline that we use, it takes a community to build a food system. Um, I mean, I'll just be honest, I'm in the infrastructure building business, you know, to agree, we're building a food system. And we are taking that big next step um, where so far it's been like, okay, we've been able to grow, make some money, get to a little bit bigger space. And now it's like, okay, people, we're, we're doing it. We're moving into the 4,000 square foot space and this is going to cost some money. And so, yeah, that's what we need. <laughs> we need investors. We need donors. I mean, I'll I guess Perfect. not that I'm expecting any of you to do that, but that's what we need. <laughs> and that's what all our farmers need: access to capital. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Ah. I see you scribbling notes. You must need a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to follow up on what kind of what Dan commented on, and he, he was talking about the how direct marketing isn't viable for his product, but I really look at that as because of the onerous regulatory environment around that, it adds so many additional costs and barriers to entry that, that you know, that, Part you know. Those economies of scale. Uh, yeah, of scale. yeah. I mean, sitting all, missing every, every daughter's soccer game is part of that too. Right. Um, so, you know, on the uh, government regulation, you know, we went and I sat in a portion of a food uh, safety class yesterday and I couldn't take it <laughs> uh, because it was, it, it was, it was rough. Did it boil down to don't put that in your mouth? <laughs> so, um, so what I would, a combination of both sides, I don't know what you could do with technology to ease the regulation, but from a testing standpoint, if you know anybody that makes an artisan product, we, we eat our food all the time. We eat our cheese no one's ever gotten sick from it. We know intimately that that product's okay. 
But if we had an app that we could just snap a test that could send to the regulatory environment, because they want us to do all this bullshit that we don't feel is necessary. And if it was easy enough that they could just go, oh, cool, that one, that batch is fine, that batch is fine. Um, that yeah, was simple, easy, automated, you know, compliance would be awesome. Um, the other thing that I, I would like to see, and I don't know if technology can could you know help this since it basically caused it. I love a, a I love a comment that uh, Michael Pollan said. He goes, "If people spend as much time cooking as they watched cooking shows on TV, it would solve our whole you know this, a lot of these food related issues." So <laughs> right, yeah, cooked. Watch it on Netflix. <laughs> um, yeah, so they, you know, that's that's the one of the thing that I really see, and you know, I'm on the board of Nevada County Grow, and I love what Sarah Harvest is doing is bringing, you know, getting the children back involved with cooking, but bringing home cooking back into the the household is is a big issue, and I don't know, actually, one technological thing, I got an Instapot from my sister for Christmas, and I I am a believer, I mean, when you can take meat out of the freezer in an hour and have it fully cooked on the table, <laughs> um, so. Uh, and then just, you know, the, you know, the one area um, it has been mentioned by Molly and, you know, technology has actually helped us in a lot of areas. You know, I've, I have a background in online marketing and, the, you know, with the availability of things like social media and email marketing. And, you know, that has really brought a lot of awareness and visitors to our county that would otherwise not know about all the wonderful things we're doing here. So uh, there's been a lot of good work done in that. So I just wanted to compliment. And then just the last thing is the, you know, I, our big initiative for Nevada County Grown is agritourism. And um, hope everybody here will come out. We're actually going to have a farm trail weekend uh, in July where we'll have farms open. So the broader community and, and kind of our new focus is really, you know, Nevada County Grown has really tried to support our farmers, but we really see the the way we can support our farmers is through the food and by building broader awareness, to not only to our county, but to consumers beyond here that want to visit our county and spend their dollars on our food product. So, so we hope to see you all out there this summer. That's Outstanding. Thing, uh, you're talking about getting a farmer out of isolation. That's, That's our hope. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Some of us like isolation, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm going to say something that might sound contradictory, and then I'll explain it. I think we need less technology. What? I'll explain. This little device right here is a lovely tool, and it's handheld by a majority of youth, younger people, even some older people, too. And what do they do with this thing? Not much. And as far as, and then I'll explain further about, but I guess I'll directly answer what do I need. Um, I ate today. I slept in a warm bed. Um, I've been around a perfect woman for 44 years. So, you know, honestly, and I have great kids and grandkids, I don't need anything because life is pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. So, so now I want to, the technology, the thing that I think that should happen that I think that we all need is we need to reevaluate how we are raising the upcoming generation. When my kids were in high school, um, the local school got totally involved and everybody goes to university. When they did that, and I'm not opposed to universities, I went to one, but I don't remember anything I studied now except a few, I can read the long words because I studied chemistry. Um, but, you know, there's not enough vocational education. And so what happens when there's no vocab, they don't know how anything comes about. Ultimately, if you ate it, somebody went out in the field and produced it in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't just happen. You know, even this, that, we, that we've devised this system that can very efficiently produce something, there's still something that has to make this happen because even in an enclosed environment, in a controlled environment, there are still issues that happen in there. So you really still actually are farming. There's fungus, there's yeast, there's molds, there's lousy germinating seed. I mean, so you're still growing something. It's a little easier. But I think what happens is people are so detached from how food is produced and food is so plentiful, at least for those of us who are privileged to have plentiful food, because obviously there are many that 
aren't privileged, um, and we take it for granted. And the way to change that, in my opinion, is is we have to bring those things back into development. Um, all of my children um, either gardened, uh, raised livestock. Um, we actually had a corn maze for several years, so we did the that aggressive agritourism thing. But that kind of wears you out a lot, especially in the fall when you're trying to get hay in and everything else. But at any rate, I think that. Uh, um, by and large, people need to have a, an experience with the land. And, any, and anybody that has a, an agronomy background and has experience with the land or raising livestock understands life a lot better because there's challenges that come there that are totally out of your control. So you have to learn to improvise and roll with it and take what comes, as opposed to going to one of those places that my wife and I don't go to, you know, the big humongous boxes where you buy food really cheap. That's probably, I guess I should have stayed in chemistry because I could have made some of the things that they put in those foods. <laughs> At least I can read what's in there. So I know if, if I have to use that that I learned years ago how to read what's in the food, then I know not to eat it. But I think that's really, if there's anything, that would be it. I, I really believe that there needs to be a, a, an aggressive effort to have mo, more agriculture and vocational training in schools because a lot of kids, I employ a lot of young people, who don't know how to work, but they didn't do well enough to get into college or they didn't stay in college, whatever, and now they're trying to find a job. And they've actually never really done much work in their life. And that's disconcerting to me. But I really think that if they have that experience, they'll learn to value food and appreciate food. The waste will go away. My mother never threw anything away. I mean, everything, it, we didn't throw food away. You know, I mean, it just wasn't done in my house when I grew up. So I think that that's because I had that experience. I learned to milk a cow when I was eight years old. I drove truck in a hay field when I was 10. I was disc in peach fields when I was eight, which seems really dangerous now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I really believe that there is something that was needed, and it's not necessarily for me personally, but I think just generally people need a better understanding of where things really come from. If they want to go to, quote, Silicon Valley, whatever, that's fine, and they want to do that type of work, we need that too. So we do need technology. We do need advancements in our understanding. But I think that we also need to have that basic understanding so that we know it's not cellophane and it's not on a styrofoam platter, that this is a, was a living, breathing animal. This is living and breathing too. We don't live if we don't eat something that was alive or once alive. It's impossible. So whether it's plant life, animal life, it doesn't matter what you're, how you determine what you're going to ingest to support your life, but it grew somewhere because you can't just make it up. And I just don't think people understand that well enough, and I wish they did, and I think that would resolve a lot of issues and it would change a lot of the way people think about things in general. So that's, if I need anything, that's it. That's a pretty big pie and a pretty big sky, but day to day, Nah, I don't need anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's fantastic. So I'm going to close this up because I'm going to, I want to open it up for questions really quick by saying, I think that what we can boil this down to, and I've seen this, we've been doing this uh, in my company since 2012 is when we really started doing, getting into this. And we started getting into this because we'd done things for the NFL and Walt Disney and Major League Baseball, AT&T. I've, be, I've built, designed, installed the, the networks that, we, that this ride on for every carrier. And that got to the point where it was just about money. And I'm at the whim of their money. Whatever they decide, whatever projects they put out. The last year that, that we had this, I had eight and a half million dollars worth of work on the books. We were doing stadiums, um, NFL stadiums. We'd just gotten done with uh, the Bengals stadium. We did the Arizona Cardinals stadium. And I had the Devil Rays and, and both Kansas City stadiums. And I mean, we were just overwhelmed. We had materials, we had uh, uh, letters of intent, we had POs. They shipped us materials that I have used since. And then just like that, th the money shut off. AT&T, Verizon, they couldn't get together, Sprint said no, and none of, that none of that to this day has been done. How do you build a business like that? Much the same way as farmers build a business. That's a risk, it's a huge risk. So. What, what it all boiled down to is I wanted to get back to exactly what we're talking about here, back to the basics of the circle of life. 
how do we get back into working with each other, not texting each other what our thought is? How do we get back into collaborating with each other so that my understanding of technology becomes interwoven with their understanding of the land and the plants and the animals and the things that they do to be able to provide for me? How does that happen? It happens by engaging. Our communities need to engage. Our state needs to knock the crap off that almost kept Robert from coming here today and get together with the folks that actually are building our world. We have to engage. If you're not willing to engage, then you have to be able to accept what is. And what is isn't, hasn't been working. <laughs> so please, if you don't take anything else from this, learn from these folks. There, there is so much talent sitting up here. There's talent that was here before. Learn from them. Reach out to them. Tell someone about them. Go see what they do so you can be a part. That is what's going to help integrate technology into agriculture and create a better world. Thanks, everybody, for he being here. Any questions for anybody on the panel? Yeah, first, before it gets too late, I want to invite, uh, I've got a bunch of books out in the uh, showcase. It's uh, kids' books that I published and wrote. Um, introduction to Organic CSA, Sustainable Agriculture for like 8 to 12 year olds. I'm um, giving them away today and, and also tomorrow there'll be a little stand at the Food for All booth. But my, my, I, have a, I have a need. Um, we were talking about uh, this agricultural tradition being probably one of the oldest activities of humankind. Um, I want to know, uh, you know, I, I, I try and grow food in my home at my home. I don't have a front lawn. I, ha I grow corn in the front yard as a sort of a statement. Um, but uh, like, do I have to be uh, this, the son of a farmer in order to understand this stuff? And my question is, why haven't we figured this out yet? I mean, it seems like such a complicated task, just growing food. Um, and so I'm wondering whether there's any tech that can bring together this this knowledge that almost seems intuitive from an outsider. Um, I want that 10 minute video, you know, on, on how to grow stuff in my yard. And we have these deep learning uh, uh, systems now, these neural networks that are unbelievable in what they can learn and what they can assimilate. Um, you can buy a little circuit board uh, for four or $500 that after you train it with a bunch of pictures is, it's as smart as a, as a squirrel, okay? Squirrels are pretty smart. You know, they know where to, you know, hide food and find it. And these deep learning stuff, it's, it's incredible. So I just want to put that out to the group. Like, um, you know, is there any way to, to, to take that information and make it accessible? That's a fantastic question. I don't have an answer. I have a oh. <laughs> Theories are welcome. That's the start. <laughs> Um, I, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. I think in my own experience and in talking with other ranchers in particular, um, I can't remember the title of the book, but Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours. You need to invest 10,000 hours. And I know in raising sheep that there is no way to shortcut that 10,000 hour investment. Um, I've reread books that I read when I got started and now I understand a little bit about what's in those books, but I had to go through that 10,000 hour gauntlet to understand even the questions that I should be asking. And I think that's part of the vocational training that we're missing. We don't celebrate that investment in skill building. We, we celebrate the investment in knowledge. We need to celebrate the investment in skills too. And I think that for me is part of, the, part of that answer. kind of goes back to what you were talking about, the pairing. Um, I've participated in a couple of those where um, was Middlebury College, I think, does it, um, where you put a nonprofit or a business is presented with, okay, here we are, and we're trying to make these next steps, and then the kids go off, and they interview some people, and then they come back with the solutions. And I was really hopeful. I was like, oh, what are they going to come up with? How to make and I was like, oh, well, yeah, I've tried that, I've tried that. Um, I think to give those, because I think what you're doing is great. 
I think, and it kind of goes back to a little bit of bringing the tech with the farm together, have the kids go work on a farm first. Give them some context. So then they meet the farmer. Then they've got some context. Because otherwise, they just think they're coming up with the next great idea that this farmer should do, but they have no context for it. So I think if they worked on a farm first, um, not just for a day. I think they need to do it for at least a, a week. Yeah, a season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I worked on a farm. When I started like my independence, I worked on a farm for a month. And it was like I knew that's where I wanted to start. It wasn't long enough, but it was good. I mean, 10 hours a day for 30 days. Um, but so we don't need to do that. But I think a little bit of experience on the farm could really, because I think that's you're onto something with that. And I think it could help answer some of your questions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use my mic for you guys. Uh, you had a question first. So just to want to piggyback after all this, 10,000 hours for each section of what we're doing is an understatement. I mean, because we're accountants, we're soil scientists, we're veterinarians, we're, you know, feed scientists. We're all of that if you're very diversified. But my want was, if we truly have the ear of tech here, is melding those apps and simple programs to get them to correlate, to help to help us in the dashboard and kind of yeah because it, it it sounds like a simple simple process but if you try and take one app and tie it to another app that's doing something that this app doesn't do there's no there's no crossover no no melding mesh there so that would be my tech <laughs> want I, I, I'm going to piggyback off of that because that's actually a platform that we have designed for our growers. Essentially, what you would look at is on your phone a picture of your farm, a very animated farm, right? It's, it's very animated. But in that animation, balloons pop up. Weather station here says this is the temperature. Uh, this valve over here is on. Did you know that? This tractor over here just broke down. Red bubble, blue bubble, all those types of things. And when you click on it, it actually takes you into that device. Um, now, granted, I'm still designing that, but it's not a hard thing to do other than the fact that part of the thing we need to do with tech for these folks is get them to understand that in tech, there are two, 230, 40 different languages, C, C+, uh, Java, Script, you name it. And they don't, it's like Arabic, Chinese, English, it's the exact same thing. So we need to get with the tech folks as well and let them know we need to develop apps just like that. Because looking at eight different apps on your phone and they've all got something to tell you while you're trying to get to the next watering thing, you, you kind of overload. Next question, right here. You use Java, it's encapsulated. <laughs> okay, um, just to piggyback on Susie's conversation with Robert, we have a resource of kids in ag, in FFA and 4-H, and I'm sure many of them are involved in tech as well. Absolutely. Or they would like to be. They're involved in tech just because they're doing this most of the day. Right, but they let's understand. channel that energy. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes, exactly. Back, uh, back there in the back, please. And I think you're going to have to come up. Yeah. I'm sorry. Our technology is not <laughs> up to par. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> this is a, a question that occurred to me as you were asking your question about what do you need to the panel. And I kept thinking to myself and hearkening back to, I, I was either Gabe or Robert, hard to tell because you tend to take each other's slides, um, <laughs> had a slide that showed a distribution system which had a single thing in the center with lots of pieces coming off of it. And beside that, there was a whole bunch of points with things going into it. And knowing what I know about Nevada County, not a whole lot yet, still working on that, but knowing what I know about tech, Malika, you know the numbers here. What's percentage of food in Nevada County is processed in Nevada County? Taxes? No, like, like, you mean 
like meat or processed right. foods. Yeah. Any, well, you, you said it. You don't want to be in the direct business, so you send it off to a processor. Is that processor in Nevada County? Are any of the processors in Nevada County? Right. So what we're doing is that single dot with lots of lines going into it, I think the opportunity that technology has is to bring those dots into the community. That'll make the local technology healthier. That will make the local agricultural healthier. That means the food has to travel less distance. Locally sourced actually means locally sourced. Where's the person who was talking about that, the restaurants? Um, talking to Eric about Nevada County Grown, and they tried to do a food, what was it, the distribution hub? And, yeah, it's, it's very hard, but it's an example of, I think, where technology could perhaps help solve a real problem. I'd just like to hear your the panel's comments on that, if they... Or anybody's comments on that, actually. I, I mean, one one of the things around that is regulation, right? So, actually, there's a lot of that that happens, but you're not going to see it recorded on any official anything. <laughs> so, I, I would like to take that really quickly because it reminded me of something out of the out of the Tao Te Ching. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a, it's a very ancient ancient text. And Lao Tzu says in that, you build a wheel and put the spokes in the wheel, but it's actually the center, the hole in the center, that actually allows the motion. To what you're saying, and, and I'm going to step out on a limb here because uh, I, I think this is exactly what you need, communities need to hear. The hub of the community needs to come together with all the people to be able to do it on themselves and I'm sorry, but that's a lot of work. It is, but it needs to happen because Google, Facebook, Comcast, they're money-making institutions. Right. That's all they are. In order to get that hub, that spoke into your community, it's going to take the community to build that. And when they do, the government will pay attention. Money will pay attention. So uh, anybody else on that topic? Yes, I was, I was really fortunate uh, to be working with the Paiute natives in Nevada. And I got together with one of the Sundance chiefs, and we developed a system of permaculture for their local people. So it actually put the permaculture right in their yard. And now we're trying to get a larger scale thing going, kind of like Don... Don Jose Carmen from um, the University of Mexico is, it, we're, we're trying to make forests in deserts. We're using permaculture, swales, alfalfa, all these different things to, to develop and, and reinstate lands on the earth into an agricultural biodiversity is, is what we've been working on. So, um, you know, We'd like to see as much of that in the world as possible. I think everybody would. I mean, really, what this comes down to is we've lost that human element. We think technology is something that is its own thing. But we forget that for this to work, somebody had to build it. Somebody had to input the information into it. And when you get it as a consumer, you finish putting information into it. It's still very much a human experience. It is not doing anything on its own. If we can take that concept out and go back into the fields, back into the farms, back into the classrooms, re-educate our kids, I love being a techie. I love the fact that I know how electromagnetic spectrum works. I love the fact that I am able to use that and come up with a, a, an option to be able to create clean energy. That didn't come because I'm in Comcast. That didn't come because I'm down at Google. Yes, they do some amazing things. But these folks right here, I'm one of those. You're all one of those. We're all somebody who can come up with the next greatest thing if we engage. We just need to engage. Question, please. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I have a similar question. I work for a nonprofit. Um, that's, it's an organic farm incubator and a food hub. And uh, regarding tech, we've had the hardest time um, <laughs> uh, oh, Salinas. Alba, have you heard of Alba? Oh, yeah. 
Okay, great. I want <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Time out. Time out for just a second. Look at what happens when you collaborate. That's awesome. Exchange cards. Do something, please. Okay. Don't let it die here. Oh, great. That's wonderful. It is a wonderful place, but still, we're, we're up against a lot of problems. Like all of you are facing, and uh, and maybe more so because we're dealing with a lot of uh, farm workers who want to go on their own. Um, wonderful program. The marketing aspect of it has beat us up repeatedly. Um, it's great that organic is growing. It's great that the local war movement is is growing. But still, getting those small farmers into these mainstream markets that are growing is extremely complicated. There's a lot of uh, retailers um, that want this food, but Dealing individually with each farmer uh, is obviously very difficult, very costly. It's been very costly for us. Um, there's got to be a tech solution. We just partnered with, well, <laughs> we partnered and then unpartnered uh, after a year with a, um, a company, a Silicon uh, Valley-based company that developed an online <laughs> platform. And it's just, it, 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 it may have its time eventually, but that time is not now. So, so what's uh, the problem? Like, if we can ask, just so... Oh, my gosh. How, much, how much time do we have? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that tech product is out there yet. I think there is going to be a tech tech application, and I'd be happy to talk to you. But sure. okay. it's <laughs> it's complicated. Okay. Um, uh, I hope. And, and how do you use tech, or what would you like in tech that could solve this? What, 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 is there a tech solution out there that you've used in marketing your, I don't know what scale you are, but your, you know, product up here in Grass Valley down to that, those good markets, well, both locally and, you know, down in Sacramento, San Francisco. Anybody using technology to market currently that would like to take that question? Okay. Oh, yes, Richard. Richard, the marketing king. Yeah. Does everybody know Richard Sink? <laughs> Give him a round of applause because he's one of the guys that really did a lot to set this up. Great team, great hit team here. Yeah, I'm on my 14th year of social media enablement. So um, I always follow the Reid Hoffman philosophy, who is the co-founder of LinkedIn. We use our, ne our networks, are a store of distributed intelligence that can enable us to make better business decisions. We just have to use these social networks, not as a technology marketing tool, but as a conduit to connect and engage and build relationships. And that's kind of what I've been specializing in, in the social media arena with companies, businesses, small, medium, and large, is instilling them that using your social networks to build relationships. I mean, Gabe's a great example. I've, the first time I've met him, but yet he and I have been communicating over Twitter and LinkedIn and sharing information. Apps for Ag piqued my interest. And so we finally met. We take the relationship from an online engagement to an offline opportunity. And when businesses recognize that your social networks, regardless of which ones you're using, but knowing that they're effective tools to communicate so that you can use it as a store of distributed intelligence to say, hey, I'm doing this. How are you doing it? It begins to minimize the false starts in your business. So it's less stress. It's less economic risk. And you're, you're beginning to share what's of value in what you're doing so that it helps somebody else. So that's it. Outstanding. Oh, that helps. Thank you, Can Richard. Any, Richard. Okay. any other questions? Anybody want to ask anything else? Can I comment Absolutely. on that last? Please. Uh, Alba, such an inspirational program. Awesome. They're an amazing organization. You should all look into the work they've done. Um, it's, I think most of the great marketing relationships, certainly that I hear about from um, farmers in, in my own farm, it's so relationship based. It's such, it's like the producer and the buyer. And it's really basic, you know, mm -hmm. phone conversations and text messages right. and just face to face time. And um, I don't, you know, I, I, 
I see all of these other good eggs or whatever, all of these different ways of trying to sort of take that, but it's this very personal thing still. And so, and I know, I mean, I can just see the struggle it must be to sort of across language barriers and, and whatever else to sort of, to, to bridge that gap between uh, producers and buyers. In some ways, she's not ready for tech uh, because it's so relationship-based. Right, well, and I just, a couple examples that made me think of were like, I know up here, it's like, there's a grocery store that would love to buy more from local buyers and they don't even have a computer on their desk, you know? And so it's like, it's not, it's not just the tech, it's not, I mean, farmers are using lots of tech and it's, but is everybody else in the food system because everyone has to be connected to the same thing, and ultimately it's that face-to-face. I know Javier Zamora, who's a, a graduate of ALBA and, and grows a ton of the food that we eat here in <laughs> Nevada yeah. County because the Briar Patch is a big supporter of him right. in this farm direct model, and that was like face-to-face meeting between the produce buyer and the farmer. And it's yeah, if everyone was a Javier, we a wouldn't way. have a problem. I, well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I know the world would be perfect like... if we were all Javier Zamora, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, as I was mentioning, the software we use, I mean, it's not perfect, but it is very tech-based. Uh-huh. I mean, it's a, you know, chefs can be in their kitchen, on their phone, looking at everything that's available locally within 100 miles. They might choose to te- call me or text me, um, but over 80% of them, you know, drop that product into their cart and, and they get their order. Um, but we follow that up with like, we just had 500 people at an event last night, you know, for soup, we do a soup night too. And, um, or we have meet your, you know, we had a farmer trade meeting, you know, we bring our chefs together with our farmers. So you have to, you can't just be all tech and it can't just, you'll exhaust yourself if it's just a hundred percent, you know, Mm one-on-one. So it's, it's kind of this combination. I mean, again, it's, it's still not perfect as it goes back. I feel like it's still two steps forward, one step back, but, um, but I think that happens a lot of things. You know? what's, what's that called, your app? Oh, um, well, there's a few. Ours, we use Local Orbit, um, but then there's Local Food Marketplace. I think there's a couple other ones that are starting to pop up. Um, are you going to the Food Hub Conference? I've probably, I'm sure there's going to be some new ones uh, that are no. emerging there. No. So <laughs> Actually, that's in Albuquerque, <laughs> uh, end of March. But yeah, I think you just have to. I think it's a combination. I think the tech can be there, but you can never lose because yeah, you have to have the one-on-one because. Like, yeah, the Blue Apron, it's like people are like, oh, I'm so connected to my food. No, you're not. Like, you're just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like our our app does allow people like when they see the kale, it says who it came from and they can click over to a profile of that farmer. And hopefully then through the events that we're offering and they get to meet the farmer, mm-hmm. we'll, we bring the farmers up and we take the chefs down and. Yeah, farm to table dinners where we bring the farmers up so people can. We did uh, it's called pitchfork in the pan, and so it's gets back. We're bringing the farm to table piece to Tahoe where it's like the farm is coming to Tahoe. So it's one farmer, one rancher, one chef, right. and and so people can really hear the story. And it's almost very visceral. And I want to do a blindfolded dinner once, you know, where they're just like hearing the stories and <laughs> eating the food. <laughs> okay, so we have time for one more question. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna close with a quick story. No. <laughs> you can keep, well, we can do that. Um, so I, I, I just, I love food hubs and I, and I love, I love the concept and I, I want to, from, from my end, uh, from our organization, figure out a way to help um, support and grow food hubs. And there's so much interest and there's, there's, there's such great work happening, but um, Food hubs, and you know, you mentioned the potluck events and the soup events, and I struggle. I live in Yolo County, and um, at Winners, great little food town, also, and um, I struggle to find these events. You know, it's like there's not a great place to find this stuff, mm-hmm. and you got to know someone, or you got to have happen to see it. You know, and so. Um, there, that's why there's a, there's a there's a platform called Crop Mobster, and there's a guy look look it up on YouTube because this guy uh, Nick Papadopoulos um, is a, is a great advocate for the food system, and this platform is about to expand um, across the states, totally free, and it's you know I you know I saw a uh, a Berkshire pig on sale there. Called up the farmer, went out to Cape Hay Valley. Uh, tromping around the mud and bought the pig and had a pig roast. Um, and the, I heard the story was on Crop Mobster, a brewery had spent grains and the, the pig farmer um, 
saw that the that they advertised that on Crop Mobster, Pig Farmer, bought the spent grains, fed the pig. So now Nick tells the beard bacon story about Gabe. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's like, would uh, <laughs> he's he's a, he's a good storyteller? Look him up. I'm telling you. <laughs> So um, would something like that technology, you know, going back to connecting people, you know, they, people advertise jobs, cooperative extension advertises local events, um, would a, you know, a community driven, you know, exchange um, be a, a useful tool that um, mo is moderated locally, you know, by local people? So it's called the Patagonia Action Network. It just launched Thursday. And it is, I mean, it's global in essence. And it's, take, they're putting money, it's called Catch a Fire is the, this business that is crowdfunding skill-based volunteers. Um, you could, if you need volunteers to like ladle soup at your soup night, you could probably find some local volunteers. But these are, could be people who I'm in here. I'm here in California. They could be in New York, and they're helping me with my P and L or um, whatever skill base that you don't have as a small business or a nonprofit. Um, so it's technic, you know, it's app based. Um, so it's it's connecting people. You know, it's connecting people with a need, with people who have information and knowledge, and. So Catch a Fire is the, the, in the company, I guess, that has this networking. And then Patagonia is like, oh, wait, we've got the money to help really help get that out there. Mm. So I don't know. It might be worth looking into those two things and seeing what we could do here for an ag piece. Because if, if you haven't noticed, Avon Chouinard is really big into food right now. <laughs> so maybe we should all just go there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we'll commit to investing in the right thing and helping make it a reality. But we need to, we need to hear from folks like you um, what, what is the right thing. And I, I'm going to show my age a little bit. I think sometimes I get overwhelmed with the number of options that are out there. And so figuring out what people will use is always a challenge for me. Um, there are way too many things for my tiny brain to wrap itself around in terms of networking opportunities. And I think yeah. we gotta, we got to, I think we need to do it, absolutely. But figuring out what's not going to overwhelm us is yeah. important, too. I think, I think we're out of time. Yeah. Um, just one announcement. Okay. We can take another question, but I wanted to ask if everybody filled the evaluation form. If not, I have some here, because at the end, I would like Stephen to draw a winner of oh. the Echo Dot. Okay. You did such a great job. Oh, so. thank you. But if anybody needs the evaluation right. form Absolutely. here, and then we can take the one. Okay. Uh, I think people are just grabbing a paper. So, yeah, we have a question. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Actually, I have the unusual opportunity to ask one question for four people. <laughs> um, high tech people have to do multiple hats, also. Financial models for large scale hydroponics. I'd like to know. So far, they've only worked for leafy vegetables that have unusual protein for medical uses and for herbs and things. So I'd like to ask, could we grow Molly's flowers and you could sell them using your hydroponics with your nice. substrate? And <laughs> would that financially question. work? Has, it, has, any, has anybody looked? And, so the broader question is, have you looked at what what plants are appropriate for the kind of hydroponics you're doing? What makes financial sense? I mean, specifically, I use aeroponic. Oh, okay. We're not actually a hydroponic system. We're aeroponic, which is okay. s slightly different, but it's, it's extremely advantageous for sprout growth. Um, our, our systems can pretty much grow anything, but we grow soilless. So, so there becomes an issue. However, however, I have a project happening now that would do that. It's just it, the frames for the building up. I mean, there are ways to do that. The answer is yes. 
it could be done. Slight modifications to what we do, we could we can grow virtually anything in the in an environment that would give it its maximum growth capacity. Like Without to, actually like adding things, I would add his because I know what he's talking about, yeah. and there's probably, and I, I'll ask him later. But I think I, I think there's two things he's doing that I probably am aware of, but they're natural, so they're okay, yeah. and that's the key, and that's why they work so well is because it's a normal process that a plant would get in its normal environment, as opposed to being some sort of synthetic, yeah. you know, enhancement. But yeah, it's entirely possible, and or there's different ways in those types of things to grow food. It's more efficient. It's more consistent. Um, and because certain times of year, there, of course, you should eat foods in the season thereof. But at the same time, people don't do that. So, but yeah, it could be done.